We're going to be in the book of Matthew for the next 15 minutes. And so if you have a tablet or a phone or, uh, you know, uh, who carries those physical things around anymore? But if you have one of those, feel free to turn to Matthew chapter 2. I want to give you a little bit of context before we read. A lot of the nativity scenes that you see floating around, uh, you know, will have little baby Jesus there. And there's usually a donkey or a horse or something. And then you have three wise men. But we're going to read the story of the wise men, but we know from looking at the scripture that this took place sometime later, and Jesus is probably now a toddler. He might be a year or a year and a half old, and so uh, this would have been later on. And so we're in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. This is from the ESV. This is what the scripture says. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream... Not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. I want to just go through and unpack this passage tonight. It tells us in verse 1 that there were some wise men who came from the east. And so we ask the question, who were these wise men? Well, we know that they were non-Jewish because they referred to Jesus as king of the Jews. That sounds like disconnected. They may have been Persian or Arabic or Chinese. All we really know is that they came from the east. Now, the the tradition is that there were three of them. But according to what we know historically, they usually traveled in packs. There was probably a, a large group of them. They were scribes. They were astronomers. They were administrators. They were possibly astrologers and diviners. Uh, they weren't magicians. And so they claim to have seen this star. Now, there's been all kinds of explanations about this star, and in fact, we heard about it this week, that supposedly this week at some point, uh, this same star appeared. Uh, We know that in 11 BC, the Halley's Comet flew by. We knew that in 7 BC, there was a planetary conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. And we also know that in 4 BC, for 70 days, there was a nova that appeared that was noticed by Chinese astrologers. But I don't believe that any of these natural celestial events really can describe what happened because it, they said it rose, they followed it, and then it went and, and it, it went above where the child was. So I don't think this was just a regular star that we could look back and, and count on. I think this was something supernatural, perhaps similar to the way when the Israelites were in the desert and there was a, a pillar of fire and a pillar of, of smoke that led them through the desert. But whatever it was, It says that in verse 9 that it it led them. Now, how did these astronomers, these wise men, these administrators, these scribes, how did they know to even look for this star in the first place? Because 500 years before this, one of God's prophets ran a ministry in the east. 
And you've probably heard of this prophet. He's famous for having a run-in with some lions in a lion's den. His name, his Hebrew name, it was Daniel. His, uh, the name they gave him, the Persian name, was Belteshazzar. And he was made a ruler in the east, and he had great influence over that territory. And in fact, if we look to Daniel chapter 4, verse 9, this is what it says. Belshazzar, that is Daniel, head of the diviners, because I know that you have a spirit of the holy gods and that no mystery puzzles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I saw and its interpretation. This is the king asking for the wisdom of Daniel. And in my own personal Bible reading, I've just, uh, I'm going through Daniel right now, so it's kind of interesting to read it. And so, 500 years before these wise men would see this star, the teaching and prophecies of Daniel would have influenced them that this was going to happen. And you might say, 500 years, that's a long time to remember. Well, we still read the works of Shakespeare, and, and that was uh, some 500 years ago. So this entourage, they come to Jerusalem, and they begin asking around. Now, if we were to do that, we would get on, you know, Sonoraville or Facebook or something. But in those days, you would go to the city gate, and with a large entourage of men from the east, it would have caused a stir. And, and you would go to the city gate, and you would ask around, and, and you might see some posts on the board. But you would ask, has anyone seen that this king of Jews who was supposed to be born... And it says in chapter 2, verse 3, that when Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and it says, all of Jerusalem with him. Now, why would Jerusalem, the men and women, the Jewish people of Jerusalem, why would they be disturbed that there was going to be born the Messiah, the king of the Jews? Well, Herod had been appointed king uh, of the Jews by Rome. And he had a good relationship with Rome uh, and the Jews, but at this point his power was waning. And a prophetic Jewish king being born five miles from his palace was not a good thing. Herod had murdered his wife, he murdered two of his sons, and he did many other things to, to keep his power, and it was said of him it would be better to be one of Herod's pigs than to be one of his relatives, because any threat to his power and you're done. And so a king... Being born five miles from his palace, not a good thing. So what Herod did is he, he gathered together all of the religious scholars he could find. He gathered the equivalent today of seminary graduates, professors, and pastors. And he asked them, guys, where is this king, this Messiah, supposed to be born? And they told him the prophecy from Micah chapter 2 uh, that said that this Messiah would come from Bethlehem. And so here's what Herod did, did next, and we can see uh, his, um, how deceitful he was being. He told them, oh yeah, you guys go make a search for the child. Go look, because if he looks, that's going to bring a lot of attention. You guys go look, and then when you find him, come back and report to me, because I would like to worship him too. But the group of wise men, they came, and they entered the home, and they see the child there with his merry mother, and it says that they fall on the ground to worship him. Which, by the way, if this was just a prophet, if this was just another in the, along the lines of Moses and Joshua, or, um, you know, you name the prophet, they would have said, no, 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 no. You, you don't, don't worship. This is just a prophet. But something here was different. They fell down, and, and they're told, we worship one God. And yet they fell down and they worshipped him. And in their worship, they brought gifts. The scripture tells us there were three gifts. And that's where we get the idea of there being three wise men. But there were probably more. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And it's been said that the gold is the symbol of royalty. That the frankincense is a symbol of deity. And that the myrrh is a symbol of death. And these are quaint speculations. And, and, um, but one of the things is that sometimes... There's not really a symbol to things. Sometimes these are just incidental. It could have been that it's simply that this is what they had of value to offer. It could be symbolic, but we're not told that necessarily. So these men, they come and they bow down and they worship and they bring their gifts. And they were obviously wealthy people. And so they, they bring this before the Lord and offer their gifts of sacrifice and worship. So that's, that's kind of the end of the story. 
course, they flee to Egypt because Herod is going to kill them. Later on, he would come and send in uh, troops to slaughter all of the, the children in Bethlehem, two years and under. Based upon the population, this would have been somewhere between 25 and 50 children. Um, Jesus' family, of course, fled. So what do we do with this? We're here. It's, it's Christmas. We understand the story, but what does it mean for us? Well, I just have three things I want to say. The first thing I want to say is that Jesus is worthy of our worship. There are many things in this life that are unworthy of our worship, but we see that the wise men bow down and worship Jesus, and we see that when Jesus was resurrected uh, at the, before he ascended into heaven, the disciples bowed down and worshiped him, that Jesus himself is worthy of our worship. These wise men traveled for over a year. They braved the weather, the roads, the highway robbers, the bad food, the threat of being killed by Herod the Great, and they approached this house, and when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him. And I hope that when you enter into the presence of Jesus Messiah, that you don't need music and that you don't need your style of music to worship him. If you're a Christian and you can't worship because the group is not playing the preferred style of music that you happen to like, something is wrong. No, I'm not suggesting, I mean, we ought to try to have the best music that we can, and I know that if you go to a church and the music is really bad, it can be distracting, and I'm not talking about that. And I understand that we all have our own cultures, we were brought up differently, but you know what? When we come in and we enter his, into his gates with thanksgiving and we're ready to worship the Lord, it doesn't matter what kind of music is playing, unless, of course, the, the lyrics are unbiblical or something like that. You know what I'm saying, within reason. And I find that if our hearts are right with God, we'll walk into, whether it's a home church, a small group, a large church, whether we're here or there or anywhere, when our hearts are right with God, we'll walk in and say, you know, I don't care about if there's a piano or an organ or a guitar or it's a cappella. I just want to worship Jesus because he is worthy of my worship. The other thing that we see from this passage is that Jesus is worthy of our gifts. The men came, they brought these gifts, and this was very pragmatic. Uh, Joseph and uh, Mary and Jesus were going to have to flee to go to Egypt, and they would need these resources to travel. Uh, this would be a tough time. So how do we honor the Lord with our gifts? Well, I think the first thing, and it's obvious from this passage, is that we do need to give to people who are in need. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean the person on the corner begging or the strung out druggie. I'm not saying don't give to those. I'm saying those are complicated scenarios and simply throwing money doesn't always help. But when we come across people that are truly in need, I think we ought to be willing to give sacrificially. They would have needed travel costs and food and animal husbandry and securing a place to live in Egypt and trying to start a business or trying to work. They would have needed these resources. And when we give sacrificially for our fellow brother and sister, this is a virtue. Now, I'm reminded of the story, or the song rather, of Good King Wenceslas. According to the song, it's the Feast of Stephen, and this is on December 26. And good King Wenceslas, he sees a man who is, who's poor, and so he comes to his page, and he says, page, you know, who is this guy? And, and the page says, oh, you know, he lives way over here, far away. Good King Wenceslas, he says to his page, bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me pine logs hither. It's this very old English music, right? So, but he's basically saying, go grab some wine, grab some meat, and grab some pine logs that are dry, and we're going to take this to this guy's house. But we know that, the, that the, the frost is bitter, it's dark, and it's windy. And so Wenceslas and his page, they gather up this wood and this food, and they start marching through the night on December 26 in the snow where the frost is bitter. And as they're going, the page, he starts to falter. He's saying, King, I, I can't make it anymore. And Wenceslas is so filled with passion, he says, walk in my footsteps, and so Wenceslas is marching through the snow, and behind him comes the page, and when he steps into the king's footprints, he immediately begins to warm up. Now, this is just a story, but the end of the song, this is the line, and this is the point of the song. 
Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor shall yourselves find blessing. And the whole point of the song is to be a blessing to someone in need. And this is what these men, these wise men were doing. They took their resources, they gave sacrificially so they could be a blessing. And of course, we can also give to meet the needs of the work of the Lord. Because this wasn't just a needy family. This was God's plan for humankind working out in front of them. And in a way, when they were giving these gifts, it was like a way to give to the ministry. And I don't want to spend much time on this other than to say that when we give sacrificially, what we're hoping for is a ministry or a church that is fully resourced. That we have to pay for things like lights and electricity and staff and roof and, and redo the parking lot and cut down trees and all that other stuff. And so Jesus is worthy of our worship and Jesus is worthy of our gifts. But there's one last thing I want to say about this passage. And it would be the Christmas gift that I wish I could give to everybody. I wish I could share this gift with every single person on planet Earth. You see, God was doing something in the world. Because as humankind's, the natural state, and, and you won't read this on the news, you won't see this in television, on television, and you might not even hear it in some churches. But the, the bad news is that the natural state of humankind is that we are separated from God. And that it doesn't matter how good you are, I did this thing, I, I gave sacrificially, I, I, my parents went to church, my grandpa was a pastor, whatever it might be. No matter how good we are, the scripture teaches us that we are separated from God, alienated from Him. He looks down upon us and He sees us as an enemy. We're alone in the dark. And the message of Scripture is that the Lord has sent a great light, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, a Messiah. That means an anointed one. And this Messiah would, would grow up and he's fully God and fully man and he would give his life as a sacrifice on that cross and he would die. And then three days later, he would rise again and he would ascend into heaven. And so the greatest gift during this Christmas season is that we are alienated, separated from God, and yet we don't have to be. The scripture tells us quite simply that he who has the Son has the life, and he who has not the Son has not the life. That's it. And so the remedy for separation with God, the remedy uh, uh, to having a life that is, that is dead, a life that is purposeless, a life that we're constantly trying to find ways to create meaning. The remedy is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. To say, I'm tired of my own life. I'm tired of doing it my way. And to say, I need, I need a new way. I need something. I need a Savior. And to call upon Jesus and say, I call you Lord, I give my life to you. And when you do that, then what he will do is he will, uh, in the courtroom of heaven, declare you free to go. He will adopt you as a son or a daughter, and then he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that no one will be able to snatch you out of his hands. And Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and you will have new life. And so, my friends, this Christmas season, of course, we have a lot of fun. We celebrate. We give gifts. We do ornaments and lights. We have a great time. But ultimately, it comes down to he who has the Son has the life, and he who has not the Son has not the life. And so, if you're here today and you've confessed Jesus as Lord, you have all the reason to celebrate because you know, you know where you were and what God has done. You've been seeing him work in your life for decades and how he never ceases to amaze what he does inside of your heart but it may be today that you're on the outside and you're not sure you're, you've heard of this jesus thing it seems strange you're not really sure and yet if you're tired of fighting all we have to do is call upon him because when we call upon him we will be saved